um, Ashley passing out from their night of drinking, and she thought she was dead. So uh, she left, and she came back um, to set the scene, and she called the police and um, said she'd found her daughter and that she was dead and that there was nothing that we could do for her, that she was already gone. So immediately the police, of course, who were alerted to this call, um, they, they immediately go to the house. The ambulance shows up. They take the daughter, put her in the ambulance and leave with her, but they take her to the hospital. She's not actually dead, but her mother thinks she's dead. So here she is lamenting about her daughter killing herself and that she found this letter. And now she knows that her daughter was responsible for both of those deaths and how horrible it was. I mean, she really was playing it up as if they would believe that. The good news was that, of course, um, Ashley wasn't dead. And it took, I think she was out two or three days. And the police they always had someone with her 24-7, literally sitting by her bed. And the reason for that was they wanted to, if she woke up, which they were praying that she did, if she woke up, they would immediately ask her why she wrote that note. And while they didn't think she actually wrote the note, they wanted to get her reaction. And her reaction was exactly what you and I would think it would be. She was flabbergasted. She said, I, I didn't write any, I didn't write a note. I didn't try to kill myself. I was drinking with my mom. And um she she had no idea what was going on. And the police thought that, that was very her reaction was very genuine. So of course they started to put together the rest of this um horrible scene and figure out exactly what had happened that Ashley had passed out. Now, remember also that Castor thinks she's dead. So she thinks she's free and clear at this point. But this is when they brought her in for her one of her very last interviews. And she accidentally, they kept asking her about the previous deaths of her husband, the, you know, of course, the presumed death of her daughter. And she had that Freudian slip where she was like, well, when I poured the in, I mean, the drink, um, that's where they got her. Um, so they had enough at that point for them to prosecute. Now, the Onondaga County District Attorney William Fitzpatrick and Chief Assistant District Attorney Christine Garvey argued that David Castor's suicide had never made sense given the lack of his fingerprints on the glass or container tainted with ethylene glycol, a toxic substance found in antifreeze, and the turkey baster found in the kitchen garbage bearing both ethylene glycol and his DNA. They felt this suggested he was force-fed antifreeze. Given evidence of the evolution of David Castor's illness, they concluded that Castor had for four days fed her husband antifreeze through the baster before trying to make it look like a suicide. She had said that her husband got the idea to kill himself with antifreeze while both were watching a news report about Lynn Turner, who murdered two past lovers by using that poison. It used to be very prevalent um, to use antifreeze in that manner. Of course, people, I, you know, I live in a rural area, and people used to use it to get rid of dogs and cats. But, you know, it had a very sweet flavor and they didn't know that it was poisonous. So people would put the put a bowl of it out in their somewhere on their property and, you know, the animals would ingest that and die. And it was a horrible death. So I liken that to what it would be for a human being. It would be equally painful. Um, it's a very long, drawn out death. Um, and so it's nothing that's quick and easy, for sure. So they presented evidence showing how antifreeze poisoning can be identified from the growth of calcium oxalate crystals in the kidneys, and that this was seen with examination of Wallace and David's bodies as well. In addition, they noted money as one of the main reasons Castor murdered her husband's. She had murdered her husband's partly to collect on their life insurance and estates and had changed David's will to exclude his son by a previous marriage from the money left to him by David. In 2005, people started to put it together. 
um, the sheriff, County Sheriff Dave Gould said, if Mr. Wallace had been cremated or if Mr. Castor had not died by a previous marriage, um, I'm sorry, had not died, we would never have known it was a homicide. She would have actually been able to do the two perfect murders and get away with it. On cross-examination, Fitzpatrick pointed out that he felt were flaws in Castor's version of that night. She maintained that it was Ashley who murdered Wallace and David, though she would not speculate about motives beyond implying that her daughter might be mentally ill. Fitzpatrick pointed out that Ashley's mother had never sought therapy for her and that at 21 exhibited no sign of mental illness. Fitzpatrick asserted that Castor's behavior during David Castor's and Ashley's illnesses made no sense, given the years she had worked for a paramedic company. She did not seek care for Ashley for 17 hours and indicated that David Castor, who was staggering and vomiting and unable to stand, looked okay. Likewise, he questioned how a woman who had lost two husbands to poisoning would not seek help for a daughter in Ashley's state. Fitzpatrick frequently shouted at Castor, inspiring Casper's defense attorney, Charles Keller, to frequently object and even to request a mistrial. So this was a really dramatic um, trial, and it, and the people who were involved in it, the attorneys, the witnesses, they were all very passionate about their belief of what had happened. And, of course, they had the forensic evidence to prove that. They even had her fingerprints on the glass. So uh, even though a defense attorney, you know, he offered some pretty decent um, defense that might have gotten her off it if it had only been one murder, but because there were two murders and then an attempted murder of her daughter, it showed a pattern. So that's really what, that was the overbearing um, burden of proof that they had to, that they had to present to the jury. So um, they also, during one of the wiretapped recordings, it presented typing sounds that could be heard in the background while Castor talks to a friend, though Castor denied memory of using the computer that day. Prosecutors argued the typing sounds were those of one of the several drafts Castor had written of the suicide note. They took her laptop and they actually found, she had deleted them, but they actually found um, the originals, drafts of those letters that she had she had typed out herself. So um, Ashley had already testified to having witnessed her mother working on the computer on something she had hidden to prevent Ashley seeing it. Fitzpatrick claimed this was the day Castor wrote the note, which had Castor's fingerprints, but not Ashley's, to frame her daughter. He told the jury about the word antifreeze being written as anti-free in four places within the note and noted that Castor had also said anti-free during an interview. Castor said she had cut herself off while saying antifreeze because she intended to say something else, which, of course, I mentioned that earlier. I had to get a drink. Kester's defense team presented a pharmaceutical report in an attempt to cast doubt on the prosecution's claim that Castor had drugged Ashley 17 hours prior to being taken to the hospital. Professor Francis Genko testified that after analyzing the traces of drugs and alcohol found in blood drawn from Ashley at the hospital, Ashley would have had to ingest the alcohol, Ritalin, and several other drugs just several hours before she was hospitalized. On February 5th of 2009, Castor was found guilty of second-degree murder in the poisoning death of David and of attempted second-degree murder for overdose, overdosing her daughter Ashley with drugs and vodka. With a jam-packed courtroom, most were focused on Castor. She, however, had her eyes closed as the verdicts were read. Her lead defense counsel, Keller, announced that Castor would appeal the verdict, including challenging the inclusion of evidence regarding the death of her first husband, for which Castor had not been charged. Um, there wasn't enough. There wasn't enough um, evidence. I mean, it had been many, many years, so there wasn't enough evidence to. Um, to 
get any kind of conviction against her for that first one. So they they decided they were going to stick with the second murder and the attempted murder, and that would hopefully do the job. <clears throat> so to continue arguing about her conviction, Castor said that um, Castor had partied in her backyard with friends like nothing was happening as Ashley was comatose in her room. Um, that's what the defense attorney said. So while her daughter is in that bedroom, potentially dying, I mean, she thought she was actively dying. She's outside with her friends partying. Um, she's um, One of her friends said that she is cold, calculating, and without any emotion for what she has done. Human life is sacred, and Stacy Castor places no value on human life, not even her own flesh and blood. To Stacy Castor, human beings are disposable. David's son, now if you recall, we just briefly mentioned him at the beginning of the story. He was upset because she had um, forged a new will for his father, and he did not get any of the estate, and his father had told him that he was leaving him the estate. He he had a fairly decent-sized estate because he owned a business. Um, and was very successful. So it wasn't just a few thousand dollars or even, even a hundred thousand dollars. It was a, it was a big, it was a nice, you know, sizable estate and it was his father's. And he knew that his father told him he would be the one getting it regardless of his current wife. So David's son pleaded with judge Fahi for Castor to be severely punished. Your honor, Castor is a monster and a threat to society, he said. She's created so much pain and death with this, creating multiples of pain and death in the families of those she has hurt. Judge Fahey told Castor that he had never seen a parent attempt to murder their child in order to set their child up for a crime they themselves committed and declared Castor in a class all by herself. He sentenced her to the maximum of 25 years to life for the murder of David Castor and to another 25 years for the attempt to kill Ashley. For forging David's will, he ordered Castor to serve an additional one and a third to four years in prison. The trial lasted about four weeks, and emotional Ashley told the judge she hated her mother for ruining so many people's lives but still loved her for the bond she originally had with her. And this is one of the quotes from Ashley um, that has been repeated many, many times because it's just heartbreaking to think about it. She says, I never knew what hate was until now. Even though I do hate her, I still love her at the same time. That bothers me. It is so confusing. How can you hate someone and love them all at the same time? I just wish, wish that she would say sorry for everything she did, including all the lies. As horrible as it makes me feel, this is goodbye, Mom. As hard as you tried, I survived, and I will survive because now I'm surrounded by people that love me. I'm going to do good things in this world despite making me, in every sense of the word, an orphan. Fitzpatrick said that under New York sentencing guidelines, Castor would have to serve just over 51 years before she became eligible for parole, which at her age was effectively a life sentence. Now, <clears throat> there was some aftermath after this, of course. Castor became inmate number 09G0209, and she was placed in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women in Bedford Hills, New York. And even with credit for time served, her earliest possible release date was June 15th of 2055, which was just over a month shy of her 88th birthday. On April 24th of 2009, ABC aired the two-hour 2020 special about Castor and the trial, which included interviews. It's really good. If, if, you, I don't, if you watch the 2020 shows, they're really good and they're really thorough. But this was a really good one just because you, you got to actually put a face to the, to the people that were going through this. It was just really intriguing and it, and it was heartbreaking at the same time. Um, of course, this is where during the trial that they had dubbed her the Black Widow by media outlets. Now, if you recall, we've talked about that in the past. Um, one of the only 
serial killers that named himself was BTK, Blind Torture Kill. And, you know, he 